Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Tejaswini Niranjana from the Department of Cultural Studies at Lingnan University. I'm also the current director of the Center for, the, for Cultural Research and Development, CCRD. Uh, this is a new um, institution, shall we say, at Lingnan. And uh, we've already hosted a couple of um, interesting programs. Uh, we'll be hosting many more in uh, the years to come. Uh, and in particular, I would like to mention here that out of our four research programs, uh, a major one is on uh, mobility and migration. And uh, in, in many ways, the question of Hong Kong, the situation of Hong Kong does lend itself to be uh, viewed through this lens. And uh, Ipam Chong's book does do that to uh, some extent. So we thought we would uh, you know, uh, have him be the first speaker in our uh, collaborative uh, talk series with a uh, book launch series with the Hong Kong Art Center, uh, in, uh, which involves the themes of mobility and migration. We have two more very important books uh, that will be launched very soon. So watch the space. But uh, in the meantime, I am delighted to welcome you all to this um, HKAC uh, CCRD event uh, and look forward to hearing our distinguished speakers. Uh, it's uh, going to be, uh, I think, a, a very, very interesting experience to have people across generations responding to, to Chong's book. Uh, the situation all over the world for various reasons is pretty dire, uh, but clearly uh, Hong Kong's direness has specific characteristics. And I think that what Chong does is to really uh, try to create a, a methodology by which we may think about this direness. Um, so I won't say anything more here, but I will now invite Stephen Chan to be the moderator of the event and to say a few words about the event itself. Uh, enjoy the event. Uh, thank you, Teju. Uh, I'm Stephen Chan from the Department of Cultural Study. I will be uh, the moderator for this afternoon's event. Uh, before we actually start on the topic and the program, I I would like to in invite uh, Ms. Teresa Kwong from uh, Hong Kong Art Center, who has been a collaborator with the department over the last couple of years. And uh, this is another series of uh, virtual programs that we are running. <laughs> yeah. So Teresa, would you like to say a few? We originally planning to have this event at the Macquarie studio you know and do a maybe hybrid uh, session with you unfortunately this can't happen uh, just now Teresa yeah um good afternoon everyone good afternoon Stephen Teja and also friends um, um of the Lingnan University um on behalf of Hong Kong Art Center um we are very happy to be for the chance to work with the Cultural Study Department of the Lingnan University of Hong Kong again. Um, yeah, I think as Stephen said, um, yeah, unfortunately this time we have to make it a virtual uh, event, but I believe um, even for our social distance, uh, that could not stop um, our intellectual dialogue. That is what our center belief um, in the last uh, 40, 40 something year. So um, I, well, I really look forward to uh, the discussion this afternoon. I believe that would be very inspiring. And um, I wish you all uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And I look forward, we look forward to working with the Cultural Study Department of the Lingnan University again, and hope to see you all in person in year 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so welcome again, all of you uh, online to this uh, book launch uh, of uh, Dr. Yip Yam Chong, Dr. Yip's uh, new book, Hong Kong's New Identity Politics, published uh, by Rollage uh, in 2020. As you already know, pre jointly presented by uh, uh, Hong Kong Art Center and Ningnan University. At the university, our uh, main units uh, organizing the event is uh, CCRD, as Teju just introduced, as well as the uh, Master of Cultural Study program under the uh, department uh, of which I'm now the temporary uh, program director. Uh, Dr. Yip's book, 
subtitle Longing for the Local in the Shadow of China, published in the Contemporary China series of Roadledge, uh, exemplifies how Hong Kong can be understood as a case to see the production of desires for the local at the heart of global cultural economy and politics. Perhaps more so than many other places, and now more than any other time, the making of a local identity has for Hong Kong evolved through the interplay of new liberalist governmentality of all kinds, of post-colonial transformation of a peculiar sort, and of a complex of actions and reactions associated with um, anxiety, lift anxieties, lift injustice, and lift uncertainties on the ground. As Hong Kong's role uh, 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 as an international city has uh, diminished and its relationship with mainland China drastically uh, intensified, the local people have been knowingly and unknowingly uh, trying for different ways to articulate a Hong Kong identity vis-a-vis -vis threats and encroachment from the outside. A most timely intervention at this crazy historical juncture, Ip's book examines the working and reworking of power relations, ideological dramas, and modes of agency transfiguring this global city from the lens of the local under scrutiny. In um, this afternoon's uh, event, um, Zoom on the CCRD hosted platform and uh, live stream on Facebook by the Hong Kong Art Center. Uh, we'll first hear a short presentation by the author himself to be followed by five distinguished scholars uh, from disciplines of cultural study and Hong Kong studies for more focused, albeit brief reflections. And then a Q&A session will follow uh, uh, at the end of all these uh, short presentations. Um, let me now uh, just give a very brief introduction to uh, Dr. Yip, uh, who has been with the Department of Cultural Study uh, uh, since 2002, I think. Uh, he's currently visiting as assistant professor. His areas of expertise are urban studies, contemporary China studies, and more recently, cyber politics and social activism. Uh, in recent years, he has been also working on a project about youth, political participation, information technologies in Hong Kong. He is also a regular uh, cultural and political commentator in local journals, and uh, he is one of the founders of Hong Kong in Media, established in 2004. So uh, without further ado, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Chong's uh, short presentation. Let me also uh, um, have a note to the audience that uh, if you have comments uh, on, the, on the Zoom platform, please uh, reserve your comments or, or questions uh, uh, at the end of the presentation during the Q&A sessions. And for those who are on the live uh, Facebook Live uh, platform, uh, your comments will then be collected by our, uh, our coordinators uh, to be uh, read on the uh, Zoom platform during the Q&A session. Um, a final note to say that this event will be uh, recorded. Uh, uh, we want to make our public uh, seminars and forums uh, available to all participants. Uh, on uh, So it will be put on our CCRD website uh, subsequently. So, uh, Dr. Yip? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, and, and also special thanks that you, to Teju and uh, Holly for organizing this uh, launch. And also thanks to all speakers, well, who uh, will respond to my, my book. Okay, and this book was already published, uh, well, uh, almost uh, one year ago. And uh, probably this is the this is the first uh, this is the first uh, uh, 
formal occasions uh, for me to well to to talk about this book and 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 also well to have some conversations with 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 other uh, with other people and in retrospect uh, I could have done uh, better by articulating uh, my political positions in my book uh, more clearly so uh, well I'm not going to uh, repeat what I said in my book uh, here uh, in details. Instead, I want to say a few words about the about the, the background uh, against which I came up with the idea of uh, writing this book. Yeah, and over the years, well, uh, apart from my occasional uh, participation in some pro democracy uh, mass rallies uh, and and social protests in Hong Kong, yeah, uh, including the anti Article Twenty Three uh, campaign in two thousand three, uh, the uh, the umbrella movement and then also the movement last years. Well, I was uh, I was more involved in a couple of campaigns and projects. Well, um, especially well the, the locally based independent media, uh, Hong Kong in media, and uh, and and the anti WTO protests in two thousand five and and the, the preservation movement for the Queen's Pier in two thousand and two thousand and seven. Yeah. And uh, and also the, the for example and also the campaign in support of Edward Snowden in two thousand and thirteen. Well, in all these uh, engagement political engagement, which uh, I I didn't constitute a very uh, unified political programs. Well, or or or, or not not uh, or, or sectarian positions. Instead, my friends. Okay, not only I personally, my friends and I always well uh, seek collaborations with. Civil society actors of different backgrounds, well, to to explore uh, new po political possibilities, and different from and yet uh, connected to the mainstream democratic movement in Hong Kong, and uh, we try to make it more grassroots and locally oriented and inclusive enough to respond to the new uh, contingencies of Hong Kong. And these contingencies, well, I well to put it simply, well. There are three basic features. The first one uh, is the China government's, uh, and and of course, of course, also Hong Kong government's uh, neoliberal authoritarianism. And then the second features, well, is the escalating anti-China sentiment. And finally, is the is the politicizations of local ident identity claim in Hong Kong, and even well, you may call it uh, even militarizations of of local identity claims in Hong Kong. And two friends of mine, uh, Miranda Sito and 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 Yun Zhong Chen. Okay, Sito may Chen Wan Zhong. Okay, uh, but well, both of them already uh, leave the academic world in Hong Kong, right? And uh, they, well, they 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 were my my covers in arms. Well, uh, well, in some years ago, as well, especially during the the preservation movement for Queen's Pier. And they con our our stand, our stand as left localism. Okay. And <clears throat> but but I, but personally, I never use this term. Okay, but but they but they they invent this 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 this, this, this term. Well, to categorize well our own political stance. And but the people and the people uh, with this stance, well, they in fact they they are um, they have been uh, quite marginalized and. And caught in the crossfire between uh, the Beijing government and the pro is uh, and the nativists, uh, especially the the pro independence movements, uh, uh, since the umbrella movement, and the the, the people under the banner of uh, left localism, well, uh, they never they never stand in the center stage of Hong Kong politics. Instead, they they strive. They, they would want to continue their engagement in social and political movements in one way or another, and they we, we didn't we didn't develop it into a centralized political parties or political party line, and some friends of mine uh, continue their struggles in 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 their local initiatives such as the movement of uh, farm uh, renaissance, Hong Kong Long Yi Fok Hing Wan Dong, and and land justice movement. And and Ma and I, I, I of course I, I show my sincere support to them and I, I also joined uh, some of them well uh, very briefly. 
But I have been less active in, in street politics and instead I devote myself to other, other projects. And, and one of them uh, is my research and writing projects on a conjunctural analysis of Hong Kong and China, uh, including the, the rise of uh, right-wing nativism. Yeah. And, and, this, and this conjunctural analysis is, is definitely a critique but for me, uh, critique is, uh, is not finding faults, okay? Uh, it's also not, not, it's not to reaffirm uh, my own values by giving others a bad name. Instead, I, I, I personally, I like uh, Judy Butler's uh, idea, uh, concepts of critique, and, and she borrowed uh, the ideas from, from Michel Foucault. Uh, critique is, well, critique is not, uh, simply or it's not primary okay it's not primary making a, 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 a judgment based upon one's value instead well uh, she 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 makes a, an argument well in the opposite directions well try to suspend judgment for offering a new practice of values and i see myself my book as a as an exercise of, of critique in this manner and well, um, even though well, at the very beginning, I, I said I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, what I said in my book, but uh, I hear I also, I still want to say a few words about the, uh, the, key, uh, the key points or the key arguments I made in, in my book. Yeah, and, and generally speaking, I see my book as an examination of the new power mechanisms of rearticulating a new identity claim in Hong Kong. Well, which I term it as a shift to the will to power. Okay. And here I would like to use uh, only one, uh, one slide well, to, to summarize. Uh, to summarize my, my major argument. Well, uh, basically, I will see uh, the <clears throat> I will see the the new the new identity claims of Hong Kong is a form of effective autonomy. Well, with uh, in which where one affirms one a set of values, well, primary and and sometimes merely uh, by intensifying effective commitment, uh, especially during the political agitation. Yeah, and in this effective autonomy, there are there are basically there are three parts. Okay, in my, I, I talk about them in, in my book. The first thing uh, is the ethnocratic logic, well, of uh, disempowerment and reempowerment, and and uh, especially well, uh, it's it's very obvious uh, in some nativist uh, agitations, and 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 also uh, in my book I extend uh, the discussions uh, to the concepts of governmental uh, belonging is a very special kind of belonging. Well, uh, it's concerned with, <laughs> it's, concerned, uh, it's concerned about the constituting a sense of territorial loyalty. Yeah. And then uh, the second, the second thing, the second thing I, I the second argument I, I, what I, I make in my book is about political existentialism. Okay. And and this is about the subjectivities. Well, and I think it is not that difficult to understand today it's because for example, in, in Hong Kong, in many political discourse, people enjoy talking about existential struggles. Okay, the struggles of life or death. Yeah, and, and uh, this is a, a very critical part of the, of the new uh, localist or nativist subject, subjectivity formation as well. And, but interestingly, well, it's also premised on a cell disavowal of active agencies and responsibilities. And finally, uh, I, I'm talking, uh, I, I, I talk about time, okay, the temporal sense of Hong Kong. Uh, and in, over, the, over the past uh, few years, uh, we, we have witnessed uh, a lot of incidents of, of a special kinds of activism. I call it instant activism, instant activism. Uh, and, uh, and it's very much about the, this kind of temporal sense. Uh, it's a disrupted time. 
yeah and 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 also uh, the other side of disrupt time is the disappearance of the near futures well people find it difficult to imagine to envision to plan for the near futures well okay to put it in a in a more local term okay uh, i remember last years uh, many uh, some people they were not uh, quite uh, happy about the the anti yell baby protests especially uh, some strategies and they asked the question what's next what's next okay and interestingly enough well, well uh, and they miss uh, some protesters uh, quite a lot of protesters they 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 felt also very unhappy about about these kinds of questions okay and they they didn't want they didn't they refused to to think about what's next okay so this appearance of the near future and and these three parts well basically well we, we can classify them into well space okay governmental belonging is about space and uh, political existential existentialism uh, is about subjectivity and finally uh, disrupted time well uh, disappearance of the near future as well of course is about time and these three these three uh, this three issue that these three themes uh, I I I try to address these three themes in my book and and I think these themes are not only relevant to a, a special a sectarian politics well no for example well uh, probably you can see these three these three uh, themes well in in some uh, localism nativist politics but but I think this is also a, a, the, the problems, the, the, the political and cultural problems confronting our, our world. And, and not uh, regardless of your, uh, of your political stance and regardless of, of where you are. And, uh, and also they call for different articulation and new practices of values. And for example, well, if you want to, well, come up with an effective uh, projects of progressive politics. Well, you want you you don't endorse uh, nativism. Well, you have to you still have to address the the issue, the experience of disempowerment in Hong Kong, and and also address the urge to self empowering, and is and also the territorial concern. And of course, well, well, of course, yeah, you you want to reject the seditions of ethnocracy and xenophobia. And also, well, uh, especially about time, well, reconstructing, well, if, if you want to, well, engage in, uh, uh, in politics in a different way, you, we also have to, well, envision a different sense of time, different framework of time, well, to understand our own engagement. Yeah, and, and I think this is a very uh, crucial, well, to engaging uh, activists and public in an interim political process rather than well, just oscillating between the disrupted time and the very remote uh, well, uh, future uh, fantasy. Okay. And, so th and these three, these three issues, these three themes uh, uh, are the major parts of my book. Okay. So I, I'm going to stop here. Okay. And I, am, well, I look forward to listening uh, your comments, uh, your criticisms. Okay. And I also look forward to learning from you. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yip, for, for that very helpful uh, introduction with the with the with the three themes and the frameworks. Uh, I would like uh, now to uh, introduce the first of all uh, the five uh, respondents. Holly, would you please? Uh, Help me to, yeah. So in, the, in order, we will have uh, Professor Ho Sigik from uh, the University of Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Professor Ho is of course a well-known uh, scholar and uh, intellectual and uh, act, cultural activist uh, in Hong Kong. Um, uh, so she will speak first and then she'll be followed by Dr. Uh, Zhang Zhong Din. Uh, currently, next slide, please.
currently uh, teaching at uh, as a assistant professor at the Hong Kong Student University in sociology. Uh, Dr. Zhang uh, also works on uh, Hong Kong uh, society uh, and culture. Uh, he uh, was a former graduate of Lingnan, but she got, he got his uh, PhD in cultural studies from uh, University of uh, University of North Carolina. Um, um, the third uh, respondent will be Ashish Rajayasha, uh, who is an independent scholar associated very much with the department and because she has, he has uh, taught uh, in the in our programs, including the Master of Cultural Study program. Uh, he's a film scholar, cultural theorist and art curator with a strong interest in inter-Asia and uh, more recently in Hong Kong, uh, geopolitical, geo, geocultural uh, matters of Hong Kong. So Ashish will be our third speaker to be followed by uh, two of our younger scholar, uh, Chan Chaosi, who is currently an MPhil candidate uh, in cultural study, working on uh, community uh, engagement and neighborhood, very much uh, tied to uh, Chong's uh, concept of the space, I suppose. So she will speak uh, after Ashis. And our last speaker will be uh, Mr. Kevin Wu, uh, who's also a graduate uh, from our department, uh, just finished his M field on Hong Kong as well, right? So he will tell you what his take will be. So those will be our five speakers. So without further ado, I now introduce uh, Professor Ho to give her 10 minute presentation. Sorry, we have to kind of control the, uh, the, the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And Stephen, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to turn this informal review of Chong's book into an article for the Journal of Cultural Studies. Uh, Chong, this is a very important book about Hong Kong and your reflections on the rise of ethnography in the context of what you call longing for the local in the shadow of China is most timely and insightful. So I invited six like-minded friends to read this book together. This is an excellent case to explore the condition of existence of Hong Kong left-leaning academics and scholars, activists, to understand the ambivalence and challenges within the politics of emotion around the Hong Kong protest. So we believe that it is important to have a broader consideration of the narrative strategies used by left-leaning academics to convey, conceal, and produce emotions with all the personal and social consequences. So in that article, I argue that there are five strategies that constitute a specific form of political subjectivity that could be called yin jo sat yao, left in form, right in essence, which is counterproductive. In this short talk, I will focus on how unexamined emotions are dangerous. Longing for the local, if unexamined, will lead to catastrophic consequences, including endorsing nativism and ethnography. And ethnography is not democracy. So first, left melancholy. So how can we understand our longing for the local? Is the concept of left melancholy useful to describe the emotional state of left-leaning Hong Kong academics? Is this emotion indeed melancholy? Or maybe it reflects other more mixed emotions. So it's this an emotional, a reasonable emotional response to the loss of an object, a love object. And if so, what is this love object? Is it freedom or is it democracy? Above all, what are the limits or the dark side of this kind of cruel attachment to the love object? And I want to put into question the idea of left melancholy with its underpinning romanticism and oversimplification of the politics of emotions in a Hong Kong context, especially if we situate Ip's work, Chong's work, and the similar discourses using a narrative template of populism 
as suggested by Casullo's framework on populist myth. Yes, of course, there is melancholy in Chong's narratives. He said he's not angry, but frustrated. Chong is critical of nativism, ethnocentrism, and xenophobia, but is not angry about these. Ethnonationalism privileges a certain race or ethnicity as inherently cohering and belonging to a nation state. He's not angry, even if the effect of this discourse is to marginalize everyone who doesn't fit a certain normative and heteronormative world will, such as mainlanders, ethnic minorities, women, people of sexual minorities. Shouldn't we be actually angry about these things? So we could argue that maybe, maybe Chong is indeed angry, but for reasons best known to himself, he has shaped his anger into a more comfortable emotion. Maybe Chong is actually expressing a state of helplessness. He finds it useless to be angry at the nativists and those who have shouted the same slogans. He can even understand the reaction of the government so he's not angry. So he's caught in a passive situation, which may be a manifestation of underlying melancholia. So when he says he's frustrated, it is perhaps because he's mourning at the weakness of the left which has lost his credibility and offers little to the movement. He may feel that he cannot acknowledge or reverse that failure. And so he's not angry, but simply frustrated. And I see what is more complicated is that there is some kind of tension in his text, which has suggested that maybe there is also a sense of pride in being Hong Kongers who are at the center stage of the attention space of the protest against Chinese rule, waving the banners with the crowd and addressing an, an urgent an urgent and important world issue. So maybe there is a sense of hope and optimism there, as some nativists do believe that Hong Kong will be born again after great destruction. So it's more than left melancholy. It is Zhong Gong Lam Cao, China Hong Kong Bernism. It is Bernism at a higher level, international Bernism, Guok Zai Lam Cao. It is full of potential for rebirth, like a phoenix. Feng Wang, Li Pun Sik Lam Cao. Maybe it is also full of ecstasy and even wild frenzy, like Dionysus, the Asian Greek god of wine. Zi Ji Se De Yi Hao Sang Dik, Zhao Shen Sik Lam Cao. Looks like the authentic people of Hong Kong and the Redeemer nativist and who to stand on the side of the people are somehow enjoying the righteous anger and the idea of becoming a tragic hero. There is a sense of excitement down the road to Bernism. So second, left in form, right in essence, we posit that Chong's refusal to make a judgment about nativism or suspend his judgment about Bernism could in fact be a default, a default endorsement or even a perceived collusion with the right, albeit not openly acknowledged. So this led us to our adoption of the term Ying Zhao Sat Yao to describe this apparently ambivalent position. And you know, historically, the term was used by Mao to criticize people within the Communist Party, especially his chosen heir, Lao Siu Ke, for being out of line. The reason why I have chosen to use this, you know, word with a strong sense of antagonism, antagonism is not to condemn anyone, but to highlight the intensity of the inner party struggles regarding what is so-called party line. The main purpose is to examine the conflict within the movement and how left-leaning intellectuals should face the problem of a coercive solidarity within the movement leading to such purchases. How far are we from CCP tactics if we are going to enforce coercive solidarity in ensuing loyalty. My conclusion. So what are the catastrophic consequences of the unexamined emotions of longing and the danger of longing for the local? We always hear people saying we're angry, helpless and sad. What is behind our pent up outrage and righteous anger and the urge to express it through resentment, violence and hatred? Why does it all end up in sadness and helplessness? What constitute our sense of local? What do these feelings and felt experience tell us about ourselves and our desires? The emotions involved, if unexamined, are dangerous. The consequences are catastrophic. 
on the personal level, it may be, you know, about hoarding things, overeating or self-cutting, but maybe there are also other self-harm actions or at least innovation, the depletion of emotional energy and insight. When we allow ourselves to become innovated, this habit of our heart will incline us to constantly be suppressing certain parts of ourselves and thus hampering our capacity for reflection and critical thinking. Where still, we may be suppressing others who think and feel differently in the spirit of solidarity. Traumatized by patriarchy, we may resolve to be more patriarchal than the patriarchy. We want to protest against the coercive power of the government and the police, but we may end up internalizing the sense of coercive control in wanting to police others and becoming an authoritarian system from bottom up. So are we then setting up ourselves, setting ourselves up just as the CCP does in order to ensure loyalty? So we argue that this is actually cruel optimism. And this cruel optimism is very unproductive. And we're using Berlin's concept 2010. So the challenge facing all of us is not to adopt this kind of cruel optimism. By endorsing nativism and Bernism, we are being cruel, especially to those who have chosen to be redeemers of the people and tragic heroes. Some of them may hold fast to the naive belief the Hong Kong people will one day be winning, whatever that may mean. False hope is not optimism. To spread false hope is cruel. So the challenge facing all of us is to find new configurations that do not simply reproduce the same structure of feeling and political sentiments that are actually cruel attachments to old pattern of life and unproductive political projects that will burn both ourselves and all the bridges to a better place. We have to learn to think and feel differently, as Foucault has suggested. And we have to nurture new feelings and bring back human decency and civility. Any act of human decency is an act of resistance. Last but not the least, I want to thank the study group, the Seijing Zhaogao study group for encouraging me to read this book and to read this book with me and we remain readers together. And also Chong, I thank you for your good work and the inspirations that your work has given us. I hope these reflections are useful to contribute to a meaningful discourse and the movement on the movement and the future of Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ho, uh, for that very uh, deep and provocative uh, uh, remarks. Um, may I take the liberty to point out one important typo in your in your Sorry. slides about the Ying Zhao Sat Yao? Really? <laughs> can, you, can you go back to that slide, please? Sure. What have I done? What have um, I done? Can you go back to the slide? Yes. Uh, no, not this one. Ah, uh, sorry about this. <laughs> Have I made a fool of myself? Towards, towards the end, towards the end. Okay, towards the end. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one, this one. Yeah, okay. Yes. So the title is should be right in right in essence and left in form. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! So, uh, Thank you. Sorry. What have I done? Sorry to have to point this out, but this is quite important to yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, oh. it's right oh. essence, left, and form. So, oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank Just you. Make sure Thank you. that I will do that again. Thank you. Okay, so we now move uh, directly to our next speaker, um, Dr. Zhang Zhongyin from uh, Xi'an, Hong Kong Xi'an University. Kin? Yes, thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be invited to give this short commentary on Chung's book. Um, so I honestly, I don't know what a speech in a book launch should be like. And uh, indeed, who am I to comment on Chung's book? So Chung is always one of the teachers who I aspire to in the academia. But, but let, me, let me speculate the reasons why Chung uh, would invite me to talk about his book here besides that we are good friends 
And uh, there are at least three reasons that connect his book with my research interests. And these elements are identity, the disjoint uh, temporality and cultural studies. So first, identity. I have been working closely with uh, Mung Jun Hong and Eric Market Wai, Mung Jun Hong and Market Wai, since my departure from the Department of Cultural Studies in Ningnan uh, since 2005. So identity in their work and also in that era is conceptualized more like uh, what, what Chong has already described at, in his book as subcategory. And they aim at understanding the ideological content and the formation of Hong Kong local identity as that kind of category. So in a way, the assumption in that era is that Hong Kong identity has been more or less settled uh, around year 2000s. So the role of the colonial states and the role of mass media has been examined. And yes, there are some contradictions and struggles and there are different layers of experience and there are different generations of Hong Kong people and immigrants. But the story is more or less like this. So Hong Kong went through the period of affluence in the 1970s to 1990s, and now it gained a distinctive identity that is very different from other Chinese. And the subsequent discussion very often is only about how a somehow settled fixed local identity is being invaded and self defend So that discussion uh, about identity should be already over in, in year 2000. And, and I still remember uh, when, I when I was doing my PhD and uh, I mentioned my PhD study about uh, housing culture to uh, PK Ho. And PK said, yes, he, he, want, he can be, uh, on my committee and glad that it is not just an other project about Hong Kong identity. So yes, that should be end. But I think the contribution of Chung's bill is to bring the discussion of identity back to life for it doesn't only discuss the formation of identity as fixed category. So rather he discussed identity and identity politics as, as a kind of um, positional consciousness to which one brings to actions and contest contestations. So one of his focus is about how one articulates the concerns and make choices and playing through an acting identity. So in, in, his, in his discussion, agency and how identity is somehow embodied become the uh, important part of his discussion and instead of finding out the content and the formation of identity. So I'm particularly interested in how one identified with Hong Kong and how agency is actualized in the discussion. And from that perspective, we, we, we understand the uh, motivation and effective experience in the current political discussion as, as different movements of localization and then uh, with, with subjects to perform, to represent, to act and build a locality in this particular temporal context, which is a disjoint temporality between the present and the future. So this brings me to the second point, the disjoint, the, the disjoint uh, temporality connect his book and particularly in chapter seven with my research interests. So I study the housing culture of Hong Kong and uh, my perspective is indeed how Hong Kong young people perceive their present as, as an unpleasant, stagnant uh, social context who, who they are being stuck in, in that social context and imagine their way to connect to an unreachable, impossible ideal future goal. So in, in, in the case of, of the economic realm, then the goal is to buy an apartment. So at that time. So my story is one that concerned the economic realms and, and the discourses there and the individualistic way to somehow reconnect that disjoint future. So particularly at the time, there is no feasible practical step like Chung have already said uh, in the near future that connect the present and the, the long-term future goal. So like the housing ladder, and the uh, relatively open opportunity structure in the old Hong Kong that we have long laws. So this coheres to Chung's discussion of identity politics in uh, chapter seven. So the discussion focused on the political realm, but which uh, when, when Hong Kong's economic realm as in my research is, is somehow uh, being stuck. And uh, in, in Chung's work, he, he discussed how Hong Kong's political realm and temporality can also be seen as disjoint, especially uh, when the gradual 
uh, democratic movement or reform in Hong Kong has been dying out. So he studied how young people from the uh, locals can find different ways to reconnect the dead time of the ordinary life with the active time uh, in, in, in the outbursts of, of social movement. So local identity in this case is exactly that Chung's mentioned, the positional consciousness that uh, which one brings to actions and contestations. And, and, and Chung's argument is because of having no collective formal way and having no uh, established institutional channels or civic associations for them to endure the mandate at that time in the ordinary life, they have to find their own different ways, different coping skills or coping strategies to make sense of and to sustain their processional consciousness. So these way includes uh, being isolated and nostalgic, being connected within a small group and uh, joining while hiding their positional consciousness as a co-localist in, in democratic party or, or in, in some similar to democratic Marxist movement. So at last, Chung questions that being confined uh, in fragmented and individualized political landscape, the localists have difficulties in building up an organization uh, collectively to endure that time and bridge the fundamental temporal gap between the coerced present and future fantasy. And that I would, what I would say is, is Hong Kong is at a time of being stuck in various ways, including the economic and the political, when there is no uh, step in the near future connects to the present and the future goals. But, but, but how should we break through this? So uh, I have no answer, of course. And, and recently we see waves of uh, emigration in recent months that which is one of the responses of not saying, staying in place that is full of this kind of stuckness, the sense of stuckness in, in various uh, class and, and layers of, of different populations. So, but besides moving now, what should we do? And of course I have no answer and, and in, in the economic realm uh, in my research, except waiting for the luck, Dang Wan Dou. But Chung also expressed, like uh, Professor Ho already men mentioned, that uh, there is a capacity, there is a, a frustration as a social from reformist at the end of the book. So uh, he points to, like uh, Professor Ho has already talked about, the weakness at developing a more progressive vision of Hong Kong and China that would inspire people to constantly effect changes we want and lead in our everyday life. So we, we lack of that alternative visions. So I, I, I have no answer, of course, but, uh, but perhaps this happens not only in Hong Kong, but also in the US. And it has long been discussed by uh, Lawrence Grossberg since 2005. So at the end, uh, uh, Grossberg upholds the belief in cultural studies. So which he finds that cultural studies is useful and which I would like to share. Uh, this is the lesson that Grossberg always repeatedly told his students that cultural studies as a project is to see itself as intervening in the real world of political struggles and the intervention is defined by the effort to produce knowledge that may help change the world. And in so far as cultural studies seek to tell a better story aimed at enabling people to imagine other better possibilities for the future and as well as other better strategies to advance the struggle for such possibilities. So political would seem to be unavoidably present in the project of cultural studies uh, in his book, Cultural Studies in the Future Times. So I think in, uh, in, in Chung's book, particularly in relation to localist movement, in contrary to some, uh, some simple reductionist stereotype bad story about the localist, Chung has already told us a better story about the uh, localist young people, which is full of their struggles, the daily life they face and the emotion and affects they have. So I hope that we can begin to see, uh, to open and realize these possibilities. And, and of course, there is no guarantee, but that's what cultural studies have to do. And, and that's my, my comment to uh, Chung's book. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Very exact on the time. <laughs> uh, you know, good training from Grossberg. Uh, I wonder if Grossberg uh, is an example of crew optimism, but 
you know, that's a joke. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, we, we would like to invite uh, Ashish um, to give his uh, remarks. Ashish? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, thank you, Chong, for your book. Uh, thank you to CCRD and to Lingnan University for, um, and the Department of Cultural Studies for giving me this intellectual home for whatever I've been able to do or not been able to do while I've been in here in Hong Kong. Um, it, it, in some ways, I suppose I do see myself necessarily as uh, an outsider to a debate that is probably, as, as it has been set up by, by, by Chong, a debate that is uh, internal to Hong Kong. Um, but instead of merely sort of speaking of myself as a bystander or someone who is actually watching with great interest, I did want to problematize the condition of someone who might be reading his book from outside that context and someone who might be looking at the kind of political history of Hong Kong as he presents it or as otherwise presented from, from a place that's outside. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to try and do. Uh, and what I want to primarily look at from this point of view is Chong's use of the concept of ethnocracy. Um, you know, there's a whole chapter titled Ethnocracy that, uh, that, that he has. And I, I, I think it's a really interesting concept. And I think that there's a way by which he has inherited that concept and made something of it that is really uniquely his own. Uh, I feel that this might well be a kind of a key contribution to the, to the debate, not only to Hong Kong studies, but to cultural studies as a whole. I want to spend a bit of time on it. Uh, so I'll be speaking in three parts. The first part, I will summarize what I think Chong is doing with it. The second, I'm going to speak a little bit about what I think happens as a result to the concept. And the third will be a much more Indian perspective, which re re relates to a few things that happened in India in recent months uh, that, that throw um, further light on the question of ethnocracy and translation. Um, in many ways, the concept ethnocracy as Chong inherits it is a kind of, let's say, ethnic democracy, a facade of democracy that is back-ended by some kind of ethnic self-definition. You know, so there's an ethnic back-end to a front-end of democracy. What makes the concept really further interesting is the way that it links up with the idea of who is an ethnocrat. Uh, and as such, of course, relates to the idea of a technocrat, let us say, or to an entrepreneurial aspect of ethnocracy that, that is there. And Chong's emphasis on space in this matter uh, sort of derives in part from, uh, you know, Oren Yiftachel's original use of the term ethnocracy in the context of Israel, where, um, you know, it's very well known. He speaks of how colonial Judaize, Juda, Judaization and de-Arabicization are linked to the control over land. Uh, in Chong's use of land and space or, or, or spatial governance has, of course, been central to Chong's kind of theorizing as a whole, uh, especially in the way that this space occupies in all his work a liminal dimension, where the actual space is, as he puts it, re-territorialized. You know, there is space and then there is a kind of an intellectual, conceptual, discursive re-territorializing of the space uh, across ethnic boundaries. The ethnic or even nativist ideology, and he uses the word nativist, it's a, it's a term of some considerable controversy in a place like India. So it's interesting for me that he would call it nativist. Uh, ideology, I quote him, keeps swinging between civic discourse and an outlaw discourse that takes on potentially racist or other chauvinistic characteristics. But the specific problem really is not its politics, but, but the, the, the discursive location. The imagined governing mechanism is something mediating, he says, in real time, what must be seen as a future condition. So what we're really talking about is a governance that will take place hopefully at some point in time in the future of ethnic self-definition, where people are trying to, he says, construct their futures. He calls it a spatial governance and says that it works like a structure of affective boundaries where cultural, linguistic, and racial differences are produced as a language of, cult of questioning and rejection. Now, he goes on further to make a set of really interesting locations, define a set of locations where this ethnocracy works. These codes and proto-languages function at their best in consumerism. Chong shows how the conversion of shopping malls into major protest battlegrounds malls becoming a stage for desire, meaning, and emotion to play out makes the ethnographic project even more complicated. And this is a uniquely Hong Kong location then for the idea of ethnocracy. 
It encompasses battles over the right to consume and to defend oneself against the unbridled consumption of the other, in this case, the, the shopper and the tourist who comes from the mainland. This battle is, of course, much more complicated than land. So now we've really entered a new, new domain here. Indeed, says Chong, a great deal of popular culture defined its purpose as a set of, I quote him, membership categorization devices to set mainland Chinese against locals, producing the protocols of what he calls boundary making processes from below. You know, so these are boundary making processes that arise from within popular culture and clue people into the protocols of, of ethnocracy. Now, uh, there are various responses one can have, but I think there's a particular one when I look at popular culture coming from Hong Kong as playing this kind of role. And what happens when, you know, you're a young, young film watcher in a place like Bombay who are who's watching bootleg copies of uh, I don't know, infernal affairs. Uh, and you actually look at how, how incredibly um, engrossing that particular film was and how little you understood of it, how little you understood of what this particular structure uh, of feeling, and I want to call it now a structure of feeling, may have been. Uh, I'm interested then in how communicability occurs in the context of the essentially uncommunicable nature of what's, uh, what's being proposed. I, you know, I think we're talking really here about a structure of feeling, a term that Raymond Williams had famously used, but which is almost a quaint kind of use compared to what we're now talking about. And you know, I think there is this question of access or lack of access to somebody who's outside that space. Uh, you know, I was thinking really about uh, a, a wonderful uh, anecdote that Edward Said uh, has uh, when he's speaking of one night in Beirut, when he's sitting with the, uh, the eminent Urdu poet Faiz Ahmad Faiz. Now, Faiz Ahmad Faiz is the poet, poet laureate of Pakistan, and he gets, you know, he has to leave Pakistan when Ziaul Haq takes over the dictatorship. And here is Saeed talking about this. He says, the three of us sat in a dingy Beirut restaurant late one night while Faiz recited poems. After a time, he and Iqbal stopped translating his verses for my benefit, but as the night wore on, it did not matter. What I watched required no translation. It was an enactment of a homecoming expressed through defiance and loss, as if to say, Zia ul Haq, we are here. Of course, Zia was one of the people who was really at home because he was the dictator of Pakistan at that time and who would not hear these exultant voices. Such structures of feeling are very hard to translate. And so the question here is not so much that the feelings are not communicated, that would be expected that the feelings would not be communicated. Uh, so I, as an outsider, I expect not to have these things communicated to me. But really what is surprising is the opposite of how much is actually communicated or miscommunicated despite the barriers. Uh, when at some point of time in the conversation, Edward Said says he needs no more translation, that he can follow what's going on despite the absence of translation. In their untranslatability now lies also the question of whether these structures are susceptible to ideological critique. This has been a really interesting problem that is a structure of feeling in Hong Kong an ideological position in the full sense of the term or is it not? Is it answerable to ideological critiques from, from the outside or is it not? Specifically, for example, do the many things that bother the outsider for example, the inevitably racist content of any kind of ethnic definition, you know, any form of ethnic definition defines people in ethnic terms, you know, between who are inside and who are outside. Uh, or whether, for example, I know this has been a debate that has taken place in recent times in Hong Kong, whether the protest has taken an ideologically conservative turn or not. For myself, and I will not belabor the point, I do think that there is a potentially dangerous component to any ethnic turn. And also I worry about the fact that for the Western conservative order, I'm talking about the Donald Trumps and the Boris Johnsons of the world, where Hong Kong probably matters not in the least other than as a stick with which to beat China. However, I also think, and this is the key point, that such ideological critiques do not exhaust the structures of feeling that we are talking about in, in, in the context of uh, Chong's work. And I suspect that they may sometimes even be beside the point. I think that we may be actually not talking about something else entirely. And this brings me really to my final and main point about how I think Chong understands ethnocracy as more a definition of a practice 
as something practiced rather than an ideological position, a longing for governance, he says, rather than any concrete proposition of govern governmentality. So it's not a political manifesto that we're talking about, but really a longing and expectation that someday this will work. Given the further entrepreneurial nature of ethnocracy, the will to act, Chong's phrase, that also becomes a renegotiating, if not resisting, of state power. Let me suggest that the politics of consumption that ethnocracy outlines is actually a practice then of mediation between inside and outside and focus then on the practice rather than on the ideology. Elsewhere, uh, in another essay which I had written uh, when I was actually here in Hong Kong, I had proposed, uh, I thought controversially, some similarity between such a structure of feeling and the idea of the modern jihad a similar longing, a similar inexpressibility, a similar discrediting from external views, because very often jihad we know is associated with Islamic fundamentalism, which is a misconstruction. I've also elsewhere drawn parallels with a movement going on in Kashmir in my country, uh, at, or whether it's my country or not is a question to ask, at exactly the same time as last year's protests in Hong Kong. So let me conclude with a sequel. I, I made that presentation then, I made that essay then, and I returned to India in the last week of November 2019, when the siege of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University was at its height, and it was looking increasingly grim. This was, I think, on the very end of November 2019. Visiting Delhi in the first week of December, I was startled to see the depth of interest in Hong Kong and what was happening there. Everybody wanted to know about Hong Kong. Everybody wanted to know from me because they thought I was from, I'd, I'd been there and I knew something about it as to what was happening. The interest in Delhi at that time was as much in the pragmatics of the protests, and this is what I mean by the structure of feeling, as it was in the issues. So they were not really interested in the larger issues. They wanted to know what actually, how was it being organized? What was what was being done? The, the students at the Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, had seen major campus movements since February 2016, and they wanted to know what were the tactics that were being used? Why were Telegram and Reddit widely seen as security risks, the platforms of choice? What was the legal strategy uh, being used to defend the arrested? Questions of that sort were being asked really. Among the most intense questions that I was being asked was around what was happening at PolyU. And PolyU at that time and the kind of crisis that PolyU was in was something that they were very, very invested in because they had seen something similar in Japan, in, in JNU. Among the most intense questioning was what was happening there. Uh, many students at that time saw it as a tactical blunder, the loss of perhaps the major reason from the 2014 democracy movement that Occupy movements made you vulnerable on multiple fronts. Um, two weeks later, uh, unimaginably and with scant warning, the protests began in India. Led initially by student agitations in several university campuses, they spiraled in Delhi and then elsewhere into national Occupy movements, most visibly the ones led by the Muslim women in Shaheen Bagh, fighting a Citizenship Amendment Act in, in, um, in, in Delhi. On the 13th of December, police entered Delhi's Jamia Millia Islamia University in considerable force, apparently to break up a peaceful student rally, attacked students and bystanders and enter and vandalize the university's library. Jamia, as several students, uh, universities before that, now reopened other legacies around campus freedom um, and in many other places, the, camp, the Freedom Square of JNU, all through directly evoking parallels and solidarities with the PolyU to further enhance both a historical and tactical connection with Hong Kong and also open thereby the inside-outside mediated nature defined by Chong's idea of ethnocracy. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Um, I always said that uh, Ashish's work is one of the you know, best kind of uh, inter-Asia example that we have. And, and his recent works have that kind of work directly uh, drawing on and working on uh, Hong Kong materials, which are crucial and contemporary. Uh, let us move to our next uh, speaker, who is um, Ms. Chant Chossi. Thanks for the uh, very. And is a current uh, MPhil student at uh, our department. So. Oh, 
I was so anxious of the time, so I just <laughs> spoke so Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for the fruitful discussion of everyone, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share my two cents. So uh, Dr. Ip's new book traces the tra trajectory of what he translates as nativist from Bun Tho Pai in the period of 2011 to 2019. And uh, I think this translation uh, can be highlighted because in a lot of other occasions, it has been translated to localists. And I think that word choice nativist is useful for highlighting how these people emphasize the sense of a pure, clear cut identity as the basis of political actions. So for today, I would like to compare the nativism discussed in the book and other meanings of local in order to bring out reflection on political actions. So uh, to start with, I would like to borrow ideas from Chen Yun Chong and Mirena Sito, who Dr. Ip mentioned in the opening speech. And they are also my important teachers and the founders of the community organization that I participate in. It mentioned that they coined the term left localism, which may be one of the ways they tried to explain their position. In fact, in their essay, The Forgotten Road of Progressive Localism, they trace two different strands of localisms. One is based on anti-China sentiments and exclusionary politics, while the other one is termed progressive localism, based on progressive participatory democratic values of inclusion, diversity and empowerment of the weak. The former one was characterized by the restore Guangfu actions in the community, which is where the nativism that is discussed in Chong, uh, Chong's book come from. So the linkage between the term Bun Tho and anti-China sentiments uh, in this sense surfaced in 2011. But if we move the clock backwards to see the emergence of progressive localism in 2006, during the preservation of Star Ferry and Queen's Pierce movement, which was initiated by a group of young people usually known as post 80s youth. Their organization was also called Bun Tou Hang Dong, which they translate themselves as local action. They took direct actions to occupy the pier based on the discourse of decolonization through reclaiming the history of protest at the site quotidian use of public space and the public's right to planning the city. So for them to be local was an attempt to wrestle with the rootlessness fostered in the colonial history. This reminds us of Sito's proposed translation of local into joy day instead of bun tou, which translation would lessen the sense of tying with identity, but, co but connotes the sense of rootedness to mean that we are like rooted on the ground. So uh, Dr. Ip himself participated in this movement back in 2011 when he wrote about the notion of local that emerged among the local action. He emphasized that it did not fall into identity politics. By that time, that notion of local is not antagonistic to the Chinese culture and politics, but rather embodies resistance towards the government-led capitalistic development. That kind of local discourse also does not put up an other for Hong Kong, but rather turn is the critical lens inwards towards the history and socioeconomic structure of Hong Kong itself. Unlike the frustration shown in the book, what I can read in uh, Dr. Ip's essay in 2011 is an optimistic tone when he further contrasts that kind of localism with the 1980s kind of grandiose Hong Kongism. The alliance established by the progressive localists built the backbone of the latter new preservation movement, according to Chen and Zito. In this movement, activists aim at preserving vernacular architecture, community network, public space, ecological system, agricultural land, and existing everyday life. To quickly summarize, their features are, are based on participatory democracy, coalition politics, anti-neoliberal actions, and the colonization of political culture. So we can see that in terms of forms of action, vision for the society and areas of concern, such notion of local contrasts darkly with the nativism narrated in the book. So why progressive localism seems to be forgotten then is another big question to be examined. In chapter seven of the book, uh, 
it analyzes how different kinds of temporality shape the political choices of the nativists. He observes the sense of urgency in the nativist vocabulary of deadly battle, like driving away uh, Kurgan, restore Guangfu, and serve some for it in deep water and hot fire. So the nativists focus on the disappearance of near future of an apocalyptic Hong Kong and thus turn to instant activism. But the temporality of the progressive localists is rather different. Ip's description, and also in his 2011 essay, is that this group of self-critical localists do not care about keeping the status quo, but are striving for the history, space, and lifestyle that has already been disappeared or uh, is going to disappear soon. So in the preservation movement of the peers, activists viewed rearticulation of history as an important step in establishing local awareness. Thus, we see their uh, looking backward. Meanwhile, they were careful not to lapse into nostalgic sentiments, but instead demanded to take hold of also the future through claiming the rights to plan the city. As they tried to liberate the peer from both the reified colonial past and the commercialized future, Chen and Sito described that they were generated bottom up as a paradoxical youthful and forward looking nostalgia. However, I must point out that this sense of temporality is closely related to the particular social context and also maybe the structure of feeling of that time. For instance, uh, by the time the post 80s generation uh, had that movement, they actually had a taste of victory of the people in the 2003 demonstration to stop the implementation of Article 23, which might have strengthened their optimism in uh, to be forward looking. Whereas for the sense of urgency felt by the nativists in the book, it put part of the blame to the government's authoritarian measures, such as their barring the nativists from election. As I'm speaking now at the end of 2020, remaining a few days uh, more, the authoritarian and oppressive measures uh, in Hong Kong have only become more severe with the national security law. The sense of urgency has been ever more tightened, uh, heightened since last year's anti-extradition bill protests with the urge of Lam Tao, if we burn, you burn with us. There have been a lot more changes to the notions local, native, and activism that need to be further studied. Uh, is there an alternative way to describe the conditions of Hong Kong now than to paint this very apocalyptic, depressing picture and in the kinds of political actions that are widely accepted among activists, what kind of vision is manifested now? Uh, I think these are a lot of questions among a lot other that we have to continue to think about. Uh, among the stories of nativists that it writes about, Kelvin's story, uh, not the Kelvin that was speaking after me, <laughs> This Kelvin in the book, instead of focusing on instant activism, Kelvin chooses to organize a community group in which his mode of participation differs from the restore actions. He cares about the urban renewal issues that happen in the district and organizes residents to voice out their opinion. He even hides his nativist identity in order to blend into the community. It might not be fair to simply pinpoint him as either merely anti-China nativists or progressive localists. Indeed, he is just one of the example of a lot of other nativist groups that have been working in various neighborhoods now, no longer in the restore mode, but to connect with the residents and do dubsek zai kind of work, patiently building the community step-by-step -step for long-term effects, while also proclaiming their nativist ideals explicitly or implicitly. Even so, after the landslide victory of last year's district council election, does that mean that the two strands of localism can be merged, or is it a new kind of localism that we are seeing? As an active member of a community organization, I'm glad to see more people joining community work. I would like to provoke reflection on the aim and vision of community building, uh, seeing these examples. 
is it merely helping the residents so that they will be persuaded to buy into certain political ideals? Or is it a practice of the participatory democracy itself with critique of the social economic structure on the community level? Hope that all of us would bear in mind the self-critical spirit of the progressive localists to continue ask questions in such changing and difficult times. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chossi. You ask a lot of very pertinent questions. The answer for them uh, is up to all of us uh, and, and, and beyond. Our last speaker uh, before the open forum is uh, Mr. Kelvin Wu. Kelvin. Oh, thank you for inviting me for the event today. And I think like uh, all of the speakers and Chung's books really um, highlight the crisis we have or the kind of like collective sentiments we have now and being in Hong Kong as to what to do next and how do we uh, kind of reflect upon our, uh, our past like political decisions on like identity. Uh, I, my sharing will be brief and then I will actually talk uh, about something related to my own personal political engagement and the reflections I have and to see whether I can add on to the questions we are discussing and also what like Chelsea has mentioned that is there some if there's a uh, new tribe there's, there's a real political enthusiasm into going into communities what kind of like uh, lesson we can learn so that like maybe <clears throat> it can answer uh, Chen's frustration or uh, many of our frustration about what to do next yeah so on a personal note uh, I has been like working as like a uh, uh, outside of my like day jobs um, or my research job, I've been like a community organizer in a, uh, a district which is like being redeveloped uh, by URA Urban Renewal Authorities. So these are the neighborhoods are mostly like uh, in Sam Chepo, in, in Tokawan, where like there are lots of divided housing that are in very poor conditions and uh, the um, lower class uh, city dwellers live. Yeah. But to begin to to before going into that, uh, I want to share a little bit about my own personal story as I have to think about like bordering as a concept. So I remember a few years ago I was like do, hiking with a friend in Yunnan, and who came from like uh, the anti-border movement in Germany. And when we were discussing and we were kind of like saying that oh there's a border, actual border between Hong Kong and China. And we were just discussing that and suddenly he confronted me and asked like, why is there no like an anti-border movement in Hong Kong? And at a certain moment, I actually kind of panicked. I was wondering, has there been no anti-border uh, movement in Hong Kong or not? Uh, I, I actually didn't answer him, but like to me, for that particular moment, what is the meaning of that kind of particular to me as I was like, kind of active in a uh, political movement in Hong Kong was that like, at least, uh, it is kind of a sim at least some sort of symbolic level, a legal level, that I am at least not being immediately exposed to the the, the thinking that I are uh, the political oppressions from Chinese government. So at least in Hong Kong, I still have some kind of political space. But I thought his next question is like, it, but that although like that actual border exists of controlling the movement of people migrant, but in fact like the the border did not exist for the government, which meaning like the freedom, uh, there is a freedom of flows of capital. And as well, what uh, we all experienced in the last decade is that like, um, there's like a strong drive for economic integration to China, which means like the border no longer exists yet. I think what like Cheng's book point out is very timely and then interesting that like uh, what we are all facing is somehow like a trauma of the territorialization, like, in various like form we interpret it, like the encroachment from the outside and also the feelings that like the home are no longer possible or stable that is being kind of like destroyed by whatever force, whether it's like a global or national capitalist force or like um, simply because there are a lot of redevelopments or like exact, uh, there's no longer a safe place to say yet. And then in response to that, like in uh, Chung's book, I kind of like read it in a way that like there's two kind of responses uh, one from the government and, and uh, to cre recreate some kind of legitimizations. And then the other one is coming from uh, what uh, Chung taught the nativists. 
So on the government side, what they are actually advocating is that like if there's a crisis on Hong Kong with where uh, Hong Kong should be the example of like a supposed neoliberal experiment with limited freedom and lack of political right or like political participation by the citizens, but still thrive as a city. That after that, like what they're advocating is like to reinvent Hong Kong as a node to connect the state capital in China, right? And that's why like Chung talks about like we need to find in search for the ji yu, gay yu, and then like of course like now is a very common language in, in uh, government discourse now. And the other is like what well, uh, a kind of an ethnocentric based politics, right? To reproduce the bordering technique. Um, uh, we saw uh, actually kind of like produced by the government, right? Because uh, as Chong already pointed out, like it, there was a uh, anti like welfare state projects in, in Hong Kong where the government actually are kind of like uh, uh, kind of demonizing the uh, uh, social welfare program and actually suggest that like, oh, well, um, there are a lot of lazy people so that's why like we should no longer continue the welfare project or we should like actually set up many of the categories to uh, only cater for the deserving uh, people in Hong Kong. And that like, in some sense that what uh, Cheung described in, uh, in the book is that like the nat nativists like actually reproducing that kind of politics in, in their visions of the future Hong Kong. Yeah, and, and hence like the idea of like the concept of ethnocracy, yeah. And so like uh, in this particular moment, uh, how uh, I reflect upon my engagement uh, uh, in this like seemingly like uh, uh, local neighborhoods like in Chamshuwen and Togawan and what kind of lesson I can learn that would maybe serve as some kind of like, um, I don't know, an, an, an important note for people who are still thinking about what to do next. Yeah, the first lessons I think I've learned is that like, I think what Chaucia mentions, like there are a lot of drive as to like now going back to the communities, right? Let, let's organize the people and like build up resistance from below. And as well, like there's a, 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 as an attempt to build up like a participatory democracy in the neighborhoods, in the local level, if there's an absence of like a, 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 a structure above. Yeah. And then, but I think there's one interesting lesson that we need to learn is that the seemingly local neighborhood are actually not local at all, in a sense that it's actually a, a not, it's a build up of intersections and different kind of trajectory coming together. And I remember the first time I'm going into neighborhoods, in fact, I, I'm, I was speaking in three different languages and I approaching people, uh, people from various different backgrounds. So there are obviously also migrants from China, from like uh, Naples, from like uh, different South Asian countries. There are asylum seekers who are living in these neighborhoods. And there are like also local, like lower class residents who are uh, basically sharing the same because they couldn't afford the rent in Hong Kong. And so if we uh, survey the grounds of urban redevelopment, we will see that not only capital is mobile, but there's also like transnational and translocal movement of object and people that in the set in this space. And so shall we call it local base or not? And what is the politics that derive from it if we want to challenge that uh, logic or uh, that operation, uh, capital operation that actually erased this space? I think that this is a very interesting uh, lesson to be learned of how we should maybe by, by actually doing the work of engaging in this space, actually we think about whether the, the framework of like uh, national versus local or global versus local actually a stand on, and then think about what kind of possibilities can move on from there or what kind of like participative democracy, what kind of community we are actually thinking about we can like uh, build in, in this like kind of engagement. And the second lessons I have learned actually may not be totally related. I'm still thinking through that, that ideas. Is that like if now we are facing a crisis of home where like Hong Kong is no longer able to provide the stabilities that most of the people have, whether like that st stability is derived in like financial terms, like oh, it's like a kind of economic, uh, it's economic prosperity, or that like it's like political stable in a sense that oh, maybe at least we don't have to feel about being like prosecuted every day. Although that like, because now it, it is a crisis there. So that idea is about home is lost. 
And so we are seemingly facing what I shown has described, but there's all of this like, anxiety, uh, worries uh, of the crisis of home. Like, and I think like my my research, my engagement with the tenants in those like space in some people in Togoan is that they has always been living in these like uncertainties and precarity. And and yet, like the idea, the, the the lesson I learned is that they are actually constantly thinking about how to at least uh, to build home in this space of precarity. Yeah, that if like home is no longer possible, it's not about like uh, building a certain kind of stable home, but in fact, like building a tangible or uh, ephemeral home at the space that they pronounce they are absent, that they no longer be building there because they don't belong there. They're just temporary staying in these spaces. Etc. So I think I want to borrow like uh, a term from uh, Lachene uh, in his research on the homemaking practice of underground tunnel in Romania. And I think he, he point out this uh, proportional politic and to say that like um, we should avoid what he said, like we should avoid the stereotypical portrait of margin and their supposed in inhabitabilities. An ever hum, hum, unhomely, precarious, and dangerous environment inside the tunnel where uh, he was doing his research. A home inside such conditions was created of adversary history, neglect for presence, the only self constructed available to them to make their life possible. I think, like, what he called is for attention to see how subjects who live under the neglect and repressions in the city continuous trade of their own space and existence in the city in condition that is deemed impossible. And so I think like life in displacement house uh, embedded in precarious space where a sense of home is absent, but at the same time present, demonstrating the agency of these people craving the house in this precarious space and make space, uh, mixed place and a policy of changing existing hegemonic like portrait of ho what home should be look like, whether it's like have purchasing housing or in public housing. Right? So they are craving their house, like making claim to make place in this uh, this like uh, seemingly an impossible space to make home. So I think the second lesson would be like, so is there what we, is there some lesson we can learn? Is there some kind of uh, 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 things that we should do as to build low, if there, we recognize that there is like a crisis of home or that like home as it was no longer be possible in Hong Kong, what kind of home we should uh, think about or build in, and that is no longer just like a linger to the nostalgic home that like uh, ma many people are lingered to, like whether like in native system, this is like a kind of old home where it provides the abilities of belonging uh, or like, uh, uh, or like um, a kind of the version that like uh, we are still some kind of importance uh, like uh, financial cities to China or in, in, in the world, uh, in the global uh, capitalist network. Yeah. So I think that is the two lessons I, I've learned from my engagement and see whether it is helpful to help us to think about what to do next or how should we longing for in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for those very uh, positive uh, sharing and, and, and suggestions. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you all the uh, speaker and the respondents for your contribution. As you can see, we have a whole range of very fruitful um, uh, uh, discussion and questions. And I think, uh, uh, I mean, the idea of a book launch uh, in, a, in, a, in a two hour session like this, we, we don't expect ourselves to be able to address and answer all the questions. Obviously it's an opportunity for you to uh, uh, pitch your, your your views and and hopefully the the book and the continued discussion of uh, Chong's work with, uh, will 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 be relevant and useful for for some time to come and for everybody. Now um, the chat room is now open for all the Zoom participants. Please, uh, you can uh, you can uh, either raise your raise your hand, press the raise hand button or you can type your questions uh, uh, in, the Zoom, uh, in, in the Zoom chat room. And uh, for the Facebook uh, participants, you can also type your uh, questions and then we, we will uh, relate and read out your questions uh, on this platform. All right, so uh, 
Holly will be helping us with that. So we, we, we actually do have about uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, for our sharing. So instead of, uh, instead of uh, having uh, the author responding right away, I would like to collect some views and questions and then I will make sure there will be opportunity during the uh, 30 minutes that we have to uh, have uh, Chong to uh, respond to uh, some clusters of those views uh, that I express. Okay, so I think we have um, we have a we have a hand from uh, uh, Professor Ding Chong Chong. Uh, hi. Please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, from Singapore, so, right? Yeah. So I have a I have read uh, Chong's book. And I, I'm very grateful for today's uh, sharing. I learned a lot from the conversation. I have a question regarding, um, especially we have two speakers who are involved in community organization here. So uh, I really like Tung's theorization of the sense of temporality that the young people experience today, the disappearance of the near future. And suddenly we are, uh, in, we are facing this end time, right? And I think part of it is really that um, because of the, the um, 2014 decision that the, the, final, the final form of uh, um, what counts as um, election rights and um, you know, the, the final form, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the final solution that Beijing has hand out as for Hong Kong's political system. So that immediately takes out the near future. So all of a sudden what we face, the question facing Hong Kong society is what happens on 2047 at the end of the 50 years period. And, and so I think that's part driving this uh, idea of the end time. But I think the other, I, I really like Tung's um, uh, research on those with, with the uh, nativist uh, youth and what they are engaging and what they see about um, that is especially the disparity between their political engagement and their daily life. I think that is very enlightening in the sense of a lot of the critiques the left face uh, throughout maybe the past five years. I think the kind of community organizing both Chorsi and Calvin talked about today requires a lot of patience and also requires a certain um, intellectual um, engagement with, with our daily life, right? It's not just, the emphasis is really not just at the moment of uprising, but how to turn every day, how to turn our everyday life into a site of political struggle, how to turn activism into a, a daily form that we live. And, and I feel like to, to really live life in that way, it needs a lot of devotion, engagement, uh, and patience. And this is what we really don't see um, from the activists who in, in 2000, 19 or, or from, from the right. So, and because of this, this incapability to turn politics into a daily engagement, so there's this huge impatience with the left. The left is often criticized for, like especially from Min Dang, what, one, one way it's criticized is that the left only care about the super rich. They would criticize capitalists and we only care about the ultra poor uh, in terms of welfare. And so the middle class, the middle ground is totally missing. The concerns of Hong Kong middle class does not reflect in leftist politics. And that complies a big, that was a big part of uh, 2019's uh, activism that, that doesn't, I think they are probably there in the previous uh, movements, but especially Jun and Breda, right? That, um, yeah, okay. so so it was so it was mainly on on this issue of the long term patience and engagement yeah. that that I want to uh, see if there are some responses. Thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Ding. Uh, I think your point is very clear. We'll 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 have Chong respond to that uh, uh, slightly thank later. You. Now I have a hand from uh, Priscilla Shan, please. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this. 
I find uh, Professor Ho's uh, uh, Chinese term Meng Zhao Sat Yao um, very interesting. Uh, it kind of uh, made me think uh, what's actually Zhao, what's left and what's right. Uh, sometimes we believe that we are left, but maybe we are also right. So when we are left and we, when we are not right, I can uh, give you an example. Uh, it actually makes me, um, uh, it actually reminds me about the Guangwen, Beng Sasi I think many of us actually uh, remember here that um, we know that uh, although in nature, the, Beng, uh, the Guangwen, Beng Sasi Gin actually is uh, an, an issue about like righteousness, like uh, how we, we are actually fighting for, I mean, not we, but some group of some people, a group of people, how they try to struggle for the righteousness or justice for certain another group of people which are in a marginalized position in Hong Kong. But uh, of course, uh, some other people would also criticize whether the tactics are justifiable or whether the, the strategies are righteous. So sometimes when we are thinking about ourselves, uh, when we try to position ourselves as zhao or left, but sometimes we might not be very much aware of our other actions that might constitute some kind of rightness. So um, that really makes me wonder whether we really should abandon this kind of left and right thinking. And uh, I think in the past year, I think uh, I want to make an, another point here. So in the past year, um, there is so-called like quote and quote a real a real left uh, a group, so they might have experienced some kind of tremendous uh, trauma or what uh, Chong's have termed uh, like frustration. So um, I wonder how we I mean how these people can actually would uh, are actually are actually bringing their negative emotions from all these traumas or frustrations, bringing all these uh, negative energy or emotions and really actually projecting their frustrations onto the intimate others. So I think um, the whole um, uh, situation in Hong Kong, all those uh, frustrations, they are actually influencing our personal lives very deeply, not only about how we uh, how we uh, like conduct political uh, uh, dialogue with our friends or families, but also I think ultimately, um, uh, I think ultimately it's more about how all this uh, energy is subtly influencing our, our, our intimate others. And all this subtle influence have actually caused um, uh, like uh, fr fragmentation in our intimate lives. So I, tend towards thinking more about how we um, we have to try thinking less about solidarity now uh, is maybe I think maybe it's not really it's not it's, it's not only about quote unquote uh, coercive solidarity but it's also more about really um, the the dynamics between uh, us and also our intimate others. Uh, maybe we are not about, maybe we are not having all this kind of um, we are not trying to coerce anyone or, or or not not we or maybe other people, but uh, maybe we are not having all these um, differences because of uh, 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 political differences, but is actually about. The, the experiences we experience from others, and then we actually bring back home all these, um, uh, all these. I know what I know. I know you kind of understand what I'm saying. All this tension. So we are. I want to uh, stress on the sub subconscious influences that we actually have been experience, uh, experiencing ourselves, and so. Um, that might actually help our self-care as well uh, when we move forward. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, let me pick up a, a, a one more question before I give uh, Chung some opportunity to respond. Uh, John, John Only, Professor John Only has a question. There. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, right. Yes. Look. Um. You know. I think. I. 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 I try to type some of my thoughts over. Uh, over the chat space, but let me just raise it now. Uh, I th think. Uh, you know the. I think Chong's book is impact on me. Uh, because I heard some. I, I heard a bit of it uh, last year when we were both in Taiwan, around this time of the year, right? Uh, uh, we were together with uh, Zhang Zhongjin. Um, I think the impact on me is really either individually, privately, or more collectively, that we, we may be experiencing what uh, Ghassan Hajj has called a state of stuckness, stuckness. Now, of course, he was writing about this in a very different context, uh, talking about the, the problem of, of, the, of, the, of immigrants uh, in Australia. Uh, but I think there, there may be some way in which we, uh, maybe Chong can help us think through, you know, what because by, by stuckness, Ghassan meant two things mainly, as I understand it. The first is that we're in this state of imaginary immobility. Of course, against some kind of idea, you know, of an ideal sense of mobility, that somehow politically or, or you know, a, a, or the, the things that we could do in terms of civil society, there is some, something mobile that we could mobilize. But against that, we're now, we, we now can't. That's, that's why we're stuck. Right? So that's sort of one, the first sense of how I understand how Kassan uses this term. And the other sense is really about, you know, whether, you know, being stuck can somehow generate more and more this sentiment of self-control. That, and, you know, I, this, is, this is very different from Lam Chao, right? It's, it, stuckness in, in Kassan's way of thinking um, would not, you know, uh, push you to, you know, some sort of radical, um, uh, you know, position. Instead, uh, started to nurture some sense of self-control, uh, whatever that means. So I think based on those ideas, I wonder if there's anything that, that Chong can, can, can help us think through it. That's all. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we have a couple more uh, questions, but uh, I would, you know, I don't want Chong to be overwhelmed with all these before he can actually. So I'll give you an interim opportunity to respond to any of these, please, Chong. And then we'll come back and have another round. Hopefully we have time. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. is it okay? Yeah, yeah, now, okay. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you, Stephen, and thanks for all your comments and, and, and questions. And uh, I probably, I'm not able to, to address all, all of these uh, comments and, and questions. Uh, well, uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to say a few, a few more words about, about my, my own background or, or the background again, which uh, against the against the uh, my, my original determination to, to write this uh, this book and and well and some some of you talked about the so left and right right and i think well well to be honest uh, i find this issue not not very uh, relevant to me well okay let, let me explain it uh, here well okay intellectually i i grew up in the 1990s well after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the communist regimes of, of East, Eastern Europe. And so, well, and, and also, well, after the, the, the crackdown on the Beijing student movement in 1989. And so, well, uh, I think the, my, my, my generations, well, my generation uh, of, of the young people at that time, well, well, this, well we, we, to be honest, we had no interest in developing uh, our convictions to, to any existing or, or orthodox uh, uh, left-wing political program. Well, uh, when, when Professor Hall said, well, left in form or right in essence, well, well I'm always uh, curious about what, what I mean by the left. Yeah, if it's in a holistic sense, 
or, or in a definite sense. Yeah, instead, I think a uh, lab with a capital L did not, uh, does not matter so much to me. And, and I still, for some, I believe that Kelvin and Chossi, uh, they have been practicing very new forms of lab wing politics well, uh, at a very local level. Well, I think that is, and so that's so many labs. And when it comes to my frustration, it's interesting. Well, so uh, some people are interested in my own frustrations. Well, I never see it as a big issue for me, for myself, but, but it seems that, well, for example, Professor Ho is not happy about my, my, my frustrations and also my lack of anger, especially on some issue. I think it's a very effective, uh, effective problem, okay? Uh, but here, I think frustration is, um, for me, is neither optimistic nor uh, pessimistic. Well, it's about, it's about well, the, it's about uh, the others and, uh, and yourself. Well, for me, why I categorize my, my I mean, emotion as frustration, it means that I, I want to, well, channel my own emotions back to myself rather than to others. I think anger, well, probably this is only my personal understanding. Well, anger is always an emotion directed to others. Okay, I, I don't think condemning others or, or, or the, and, and, and then feeling, and the feeling of self-righteousness is, is not the option, okay. And, and well, or, or, well in, in some sense, I'm, I'm quite traditionalist. Well, I, I follow Manchus, well, Manchus, advice as well to seek the cause in oneself rather than somebody else. Yeah. Okay, that's why I sketch out the three, the, the three themes. That these three themes are, are, not, the, are not the mistakes uh, committed by, by nativists or by, by, by any people, but they are the problems confronting us. Yeah, and so that's why I thank you Ashish he he brought in the idea of structures of feeling. Probably I should, I should use this this uh, Raymond Williams uh, famous term well in my book. Well, uh, structure of feelings because well I this is my understanding is that methodologic methodologically it reminds us of our embed embeddedness in the structures, and in in some sort of relationship with others well structurally, and you don't need to endorse uh, nativist existential struggles, but you have to address the ontological conditions of Hong Kong, right? For example, uh, recently a, a significant number of people, they are leaving or planning to leave Hong Kong uh, because they feel while well, shocked by, by the deteriorating political situations. Well, and they perceive that these, these shocks are in a very well uh, ontological sense. Yeah. And, and you cannot explain away uh, this fear with the notions of forced consciousness, yeah. And uh, thank you, Chaucer's as analysis of uh, nativisms, uh, localisms, and uh, the issues of translation. Yeah, it's true that, well, I, I use the term nativisms rather than localisms. Well, it's an attempt to reclaim, reclaim the, the ambivalence of the term local and localisms. Yeah, so, so for me, well, local uh, nativism is more specific, it's more a little bit uh, sectarian, um, but localism, a local, uh, well, it points to more interpretation and possibilities. Yeah, and uh, and also, I think I like the the idea uh, proposed by Kelvin, uh, home, especially at the end of his presentations about homemaking. Yeah, probably this is the uh, this is an 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 urgent issues for for all of us for all of us. Yeah, and we uh, many well, Hong Kong people, well, we got these cities as their homes uh, uh, since uh, 1970s. Well, according to some sociologists uh, such as Lloyd Dialog and, and others. And so probably now, well, we need to remake our home. Okay, we need to remake our home. And, and, and we have to take the issues of homemaking. Okay, not, not only home, not, not the feeling uh, being at home, but also uh, homemaking uh, in a serious manner. Okay. I think that is a, and it, and and I don't have a, have much thought about the the issues well uh, raised by John. I, but but these are very good issues about stuckness, okay, stuckness and the immobility and mobility. Well, 
I, I don't have any well answer to, to this question. This is a very, I think this is a very difficult question, not only for me, for, for every one of us yeah, here, especially for people in Hong Kong. I think, well, uh, Kevin's uh, idea of homemaking probably is a, is a, is a, is a good beginning. Well, uh, homemaking and, and of course, well, uh, probably when we talk about stuckiness, well, we are talking about a situation or conditions that even uh, more, I would say, uh, more low profile than the homemaking. Well, we, sometimes we feel that we cannot make anything. Well, but probably we are just waiting. But waiting probably it could be, well, might be or could be also productive. Well, how to wait for something in a productive way, I, I'm not sure. But, but uh, I, think, I think this is uh, waiting. Waiting in a productive sense, a productive way, probably is a, is a, probably is a, is a, is a, is a phrase, is a, is a notion. Well, probably well, could uh, characterize my, my situation in a more uh, accurate way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few more uh, hands and, and uh, questions or remarks in the chat room. I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Zheng Ziwei to speak. Yes, I can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, hi, I, 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 I'm not sure if this is a question, um, but I just noticed um, um, talk there are many discussions, including this talk, um, which give me give me a, uh, a feeling that um, there is some kind of post post movement analysis or characterization or understanding of what the movement was. Um, um, why do I phrase this way? Um, because um, Chong's book um, seemed to surprisingly to me. Um, um, to be offering a kind of analysis, which is quite similar to Lui Dai Lok's book called Ambivalence, Gam Gai in Chinese, um, in characterizing the movement. Oh, of course, there, there, there are many differences between, between the analysis. Um, uh, uh, but the overall feeling is that um, um, there's a, this kind of analysis trying to capture the essence of the movement um, um, in a way saying that, um, it is. It is. It is about Lam Chao. Uh, it is about you. 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 You burn. If we. If. If we burn, you burn with us. That kind of extreme version of localism. Um, but to me, uh, there are many levels um, or, 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 or things going on uh, in the past year. One is at this course level. Uh, uh, I, I. I. I'm not sure about my feeling, but but to me, Chong spoke. Is actually more about the discourse level, uh, the discourse, uh, the discourse of um, uh, uh, Lam Chao, um, and actually what people did and think um, in the past year varies so much. Uh, for example, um, when I was in several demonstrations uh, in the past year, and um, sometimes uh, people keep saying five demands, not one less. It's, it's actually very specific. It's nobody's calling for independence, Hong Kong independence. It's just five, you, you, you all remember what those five demands is. And many Hong Kong people actually just want that. And no people talk about Hong Kong independence. Whenever the, the, some people called in the crowd, say Hong Kong independence, then people, uh, much less people shout that uh, slogan. Uh, which seems to me that there, there, there are many varieties, um, um, uh, a, a, a variety of people thinking um, differently within this umbrella term of extreme localist version, um, um, trying to capture the movement. So um, 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 what I wanted to say is um, this kind of post movement characterization uh, I, 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 I'm, 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 uh, analysis, I'm, a little bit concerned about this kind of discussion, trying to capture the movement um, or, 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 or the capture by the movement from the discourse level, um, extending to a kind of sociological analysis of what the people actually in Hong Kong think and feel 
um, towards this extreme version of localist movement. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to, to be brief, so I stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chang. Um, we have uh, comments on the chat box. Uh, there's a previous one. Holly, do you want to help us to locate that? Uh, I think it is from Ping Yun. Right, so the question from Ping Yun is, are we at the stage of purgatory? after burnism, um, after burnism happens and there is not clear if heaven and hell we shall head to? That's the question. All right, okay, thank you. And then there is uh, another one, uh, which is a more recent one from uh, Jennifer Tang. You can all refer to that in your chat room. Uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, Chong's work centrally concerns constructing a local uh, or Hong Kong identity that can be defended from external threat. I'm wondering how we can understand the idea of the local when Kevin and others have touched upon the local in Hong Kong itself, very multi-ethnic, multicultural, and arguably transnational. To what extent is it useful to invoke the notion of the local in conceptualizing Hong Kong's autonomy, cultural or otherwise, and in mobilizing for it. Can there be one Hong Kong identity, or do we need to address that there will always be multiple equally valid and sometimes contesting uh, identities in which inhabitants of the city find their own find a sense of belonging, and that our cultural and political community might have to work with our internal differences in construction in constructing potential political futures. So that was uh, that was uh, the questions and remarks so far. Mm. Stephen, do you mind yeah. if I jump in a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe I can respond a little bit to Jennifer or Zy and some others. I think I'm very, uh, I think these questions are the most valid. There is really an internal diversity within the nativist group. And as uh, Chaozi has rightly argued, so why have we forgotten about the progressive elements of localism? And instead, our focus has always been, you know, focusing on this nativist with this territorial loyalty and ethnocracy. And ethnocracy. So I feel like um, Kevin and the um comments are actually very subversive and visionary in many ways. But the problem, as I see it now, I'm so glad that many of you ask, ask and many of you talk about the structure of feeling and also Chong thinks that it is important to talk about structure of feeling because who are these people that we are talking about? Hong Kong people, middle class is missing in this whole description in some of the mainstream discussion or discourse on the movement as Dr. Ding has rightly pointed out. So I think it's the creation of a myth of the people. And then these people, the people actually has a, you know, internal diversity that has never been talked about because some of the voices can never be heard. And we intellectuals part participate in this, what I call collusion of the, with the right wing, actually, of course, I, I don't care about what exactly is left and right in, in some level. But at the same time, what I want to say is, if we're not critical of this kind of discourse, then we are endorsing this type of ethnocracy, territorial loyalty, ethnocentrism, xenophobia, homophobia. We are endorsing all these things, whatever you call that, left or right, doesn't matter, but are we, supporting all these you know emotions are we shouldn't we be unpacking the discourse and make it possible for different voices to be heard so that we are not stuck in this imaginary stuckness i think it's all imaginary of course we are stuck but if we keep on producing all this discourse and accepting this existential anxiety this ontological problem of hong kong then we will always be stuck and the, and the voices like Chaucy and Kevin, whoever, can never be really developed further because we refuse to go further 
we're just trying to you know celebrate suffering in some sense and and enjoy this being stuck and and talking about this helplessness as a way to escape facing the problem and that's why we are like Lloyd dialogue said said always in this calm guy position and we have never enter into a, the dialogue about one country two system so that's how i you know feel, that's why i want to use those concepts left melancholy crew optimism but you know they're not important they're just theoretical tools but the condition of existence of intellectuals public intellectuals and academics and why and what are we doing in in our discourse and in the way we you know make it not possible for certain vision to surface i think that is really problematic and that bothers me a lot and that's why i have to you know create this term which is really honestly it's not the best term but it's i can't express how i feel about this ambivalence and this ambivalence must be unpacked and we must be self-critical and of course fan is important but fan must involve an admission of our failure and our wrongdoings and a self-critique um, Sorry, I don't know whether it's productive, but I... Right, right, yes. Uh, we we are s stuck on the virtual platform, but we're not stuck in time because we already crossed the border of time. Oh, so sorry. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm a very less afraid chair. Uh, are there any more comments? Uh, we can extend this for a few more minutes uh, since the discussion seemed to be going on quite... Uh, actively, uh, whether from this, this other respondents or from other speakers or from participants. Actually, I'm quite, quite uh, intrigued by this notion of the stuckedness, John. Uh, and in light of uh, Chong's framework, uh, I suppose that concept captures both the deadlock in time and in space, and in the, the, lo the kind of locality that I think is central, and many of the speakers already talk about it, uh, in, in a way, the politics of identity is a politic of locality, and especially for this place that, you know, we call home. And I think, um, therefore, I mean, uh, Gazan, Gazan, of course, is a, is a great uh, theories of discourse, but I don't think he is uh, inventing <laughs> uh, the situation. Uh, rather, he he's uh, he's conceptually or discursively trying to help us to uh, help us both people who are inside the stuckness and outside the stuckness in different ways, right? Because some of you we've been talking about one identity and the problem with that, but then. If there is a big stuckness, that big stuckness is not constituted by one particular factor or another, but multiple. And this is not also, I mean, I, I, I take the point that uh, uh, Chen Wei took uh, mentioned about the discussion now being about seemingly about the 2019 and 20 events. But as we all know, the, the work that of Chong's work, uh, book, represented in Chong's book, actually is a culmination of of a, of a long period of uh, contemporary social and political and cultural development in Hong Kong, which in one way or another, I think directly contribute to what's happening now. Uh, although we're not seeing it as a kind of a comprehensive theory as such. So I think many of these concepts are actually useful um, depending on one's uh, perspective and approach. I think also involve approach to scholarship and intellectual endeavor. Uh, personally, I find that notion of stuckness very apt in describing at both micro and macro level, the situation with, that we are living in. And precisely, you know, the entanglement and the efforts to disentangle, I think is, is bothering or not bothering, is uh, engaging everyone uh, both in his private, pro professional, social, public, and political uh, life, right? If there is still political life, uh, uh, and I think I, th I think that and that that sense is interesting because 
now that time is stuck for once, you know, uh, because I mean, if you're looking at that, so nobody is now looking or eat, you know, fruitfully except except for 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 the new party that is forming. Maybe, maybe they have their version of of time, but for ordinary people, I don't think uh, either. It is because of the traditional uh, struggles and encroachment that they have always experienced, as Chaucy pointed out, uh, in their neighborhood, in their community, all over the last uh, two or three decades already, or because of the more recent uh, drastic changes that allow us to see clearly that there was uh, this particular stuckness in time. And then therefore the question I think shift to as all many of the respondents uh, pointed out, shift to the whole issue of space and locality and 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 bordering. Of course, we haven't talked about you know the whole uh, emerging trend of exodus, for example, which is not which hasn't come into the picture in this discussion. But I think it is also something to be to be uh, to be considered. Right. Sorry, Stephen, just very quick note on time. Since everybody liked the concept of, you know, stuckness, but I think this, we have chosen to be stuck when we create this concept of time and refuse to look at the urgency that we have constructed. It's really a social process and we should, we should, you know, make an effort if we want to be, you know, get ahead and not saying that, okay, stuckness is exactly how we feel. Stuckness, imaginary stuckness is our problem. It should be. Tula, for me, it is not imaginary, it is lived. And for many people, it is lived, stuckness. So I think so, we have a, it is we so. have a, Your we have a disagreement is here, which is fine, right? And, and, and I think uh, 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 the lift situation, so I, in, a, in my intro, I talk about the lift situation, whether they are, however one is, uh, regardless of one's gender, class, political ideology, uh, if they feel that they are caught in a particular situation, not necessarily during this political deadlock, but in other local, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, ethnographic uh, and, and community engagement histories from, from these uh, works that some of our younger colleagues uh, does, uh, would show that this is not a situation where, of course, some of the stuckness are not considered important by the regime, right? By our universities, by our government, right? But others, and you know, in a in a peculiar way, all this is now spreading over to all sectors, and regardless of whether you want to talk about it. Uh, people in their individual life, I mean, I, I won't say all people, but for a lot of people, uh, I think for once, uh, uh, I think we do not see this uh, in Hong Kong since uh, 1990s, uh, since the 1990s, b before the before the handover, before the handover, people don't see stuckness stuck in, in the way that we see it now. If, if you if you understand what I mean, yeah, I'm not questioning. I'm not questioning is a lived experience. I'm not questioning is a felt experience. I'm not questioning is genuine feeling. And maybe of course there is some objective truth, but what I'm questioning is the structure of feeling that has made it impossible for us to think differently and feel differently. So that even the felt experience is genuine, we have to look at the structure of feeling and see what are the underlying things that can be right, right, yeah. out. So, <laughs> sorry. And, and, and yeah, just sorry, I, I, I think I yeah, yeah, yeah. think okay, we understand yeah. each other. Your point. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if Chong want to have the final word. I mean, you should. No, no, no. <laughs> you must. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by so many <laughs> questions and then come. You were stuck with this. Uh... Yeah, I, I got stuck. <laughs> you shouldn't. You shouldn't. We shouldn't. Well, but I thought I, I was curious. Uh, I probably haven't read your book very thoroughly. I didn't know that you didn't use the term structural feeling. 
uh, well, probably not, not, not in a very serious way. I, I don't remember whether I, I, I oh. mentioned about it, but, but probably, well, not in a very serious way. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Because that, that was the, that was obvious. That was, of course, what the uh, Kin was pointing out. In, yes. Yeah. Uh, learning from, uh, you know, Grossberg. Uh, mm. uh, of course, Grossberg, uh, in, in that way, an example of uh, culture study as, as it was or as it has been, mm. uh, seemingly refused to be to be stuck, although you know he, he is very much stuck right <laughs> now in, in, <laughs> in this historical and ideological uh, 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 trauma that has been you know that has actually forced him or prompted him to be writing his last few books, you know, about, about the U.S. and about culture study. Uh, I, I know that he's still thinking about this whole issue in light of the current changes. But I think um, it also, I think Chong's point, uh, I mean, Kin's point, I, I want to use that as a, as a closure to this uh, meeting, because after all, this is a cultural study event. And, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I mean, I don't want to sound optimistic. Uh, those of you who know me know that I'm far from an optimist. I will never be an optimist, uh, I can assure you. Uh, but uh, is there still hope for cultural studies, you know, here and across the borders? And I hope that uh, continual discussions of the kind will lead us to think that uh, this is a field which uh, draw together some uh, intellectual scholars and especially I'm very happy to see younger scholars uh, joining and, uh, and uh, also hopefully people in the broader artistic and cultural uh, community through uh, Hong Kong Art Center's uh, enhancement could uh, draw in into this debate so that it doesn't uh, remain just a very sectorial, uh, narrow uh, academic discussion, which is increasingly, of course, uh, 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 uninteresting. <laughs> all right, so uh, on that note, I want to say uh, thank you for all the speakers, to uh, Chong, of course, and uh, to all the respondents and thank all you. the participants, all the uh, uh, personnel with us uh, who have helped, and uh, Holly, uh, Holly Leung from our center, and all the uh, uh, respondents and uh, people who have raised questions. Uh, the center will continue to have activities uh, in the next semester in the first quarter, in the first uh, term of 2001. I think we are actually thinking of one or two more book launches, but uh, we are, we have to, we have yet to set our plan given the, you know, really uncertain uh, environment uh, that we're living in. But in any case, this has been a a uh, very productive uh, session. Uh, Teju, do you have any final word to, yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, all right. All this drama, I didn't have that much to say, but I'm so delighted that this uh, small occasion of the book launch uh, became such a, a very, very active platform to be discussing Chong's extremely important book. Uh, so I'm so grateful to have had the chance to hear all of you, especially our youngest uh, members uh, of, on the panel. And um, I look forward to the day when uh, CCRD can launch the books of Kelvin Wu and Chan Shorsi as well. Mm. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to be satisfied with two right. other launches. <laughs> uh, probably in March, we will keep you posted uh, of uh, Roberto Castillo's book, which is just out, and uh, Lisa Leung's book as well. So we look forward to having you with us on those occasions as well. And we hope the discussion will be as exciting as it has been today. Thank you all for coming. And Teresa, thanks so much. We look forward to scheduling the next events with you, hopefully in person. Right, right, right. We, could, we should go to Art Center next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.